Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's nice to see all your smiling faces. Are there any Japanese people here? Yeah. Yeah, Disneyland must be closed. All right, well. Good to see you. Yeah. Well, I'm Japanese myself. Actually, I'm only half Japanese. I'm half Japanese by my mother's side and half American by a friend of my father. So it works out real nice. That's right, buddy. My daddy's from Arkansas, and uh, my mom's from Japan, so we had a lot of cross-culture dilemmas in my house. My dad would take us fishing, and mom would eat the bait on the way there. <laughs> People always think I'm an Indian, though. Do you look like an Indian? Yeah. I always get that. Usually in the South, drunken rednecks would come up to me and go, Hey, Chief, where's that bingo hall? <laughs> I have no idea, Goober, but good luck to you, man. You know. Oh, I got that all my life. When I was a kid on Halloween, I could be dressed like a Martian. Some guy would come through the door. Honey, there's a little Indian boy out here. Yeah. They would hand out candy to the other kids. They put corn in my bag. You know? I have a sack full of Mazzola at the end of the night, man. You know? Ain't no fun. Because I think the most beautiful women in the world live in Los Angeles. Don't you think so? Yeah. yeah sure. None of them are from Los Angeles. But every chick who became rutabaga queen in her hometown, they all flock out here to become Charlie's Angels, you know what I mean? But uh, I, I think the most uh, beautiful and the most neurotic women, women live out here. You ever talk to some of these women for like five minutes? It's like, Jesus, good luck with all that baggage, boy. Like, oh, I'm not an emotional skycap. I can't carry all that for you. I'm sorry. All right? But everybody here is crazy. Everybody in L.A. is in therapy. It kills me, you know? It's just a good thing that we don't have parking spaces for the emotionally handicapped, too, because there'd be no place to park around here. That's the uh, wild and crazy Jackson Purdue, and uh, we're going to talk to him in a minute. This is Frankie Pace. This is the Frankie Pace Show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Jackson, my man, how you doing, brother? What's up, man? That was painful to listen to. <laughs> That's an old cut, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> that was really painful. <laughs> uh, you had long hair there, man. The, the hair was down to you. I'm still doing the same jokes, but I'm just doing them better. <laughs> what? You cut all your hair off? You look good, man, without all that hair. Before, I didn't I didn't know where you were going, man. Uh, I was apparently nowhere, so I, I cut it. <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, man? You know, I'm still out here uh, in the trenches, man, you know, trying not to get a day job. <laughs> Big show business goal. Good old L.A. <laughs> you started, what, around, what, 1977 you started doing comedy? Yeah, I started at the comedy store in Hollywood. Uh, good old Mitzi Shore. She's still kicking, I, I guess. I, I, I guess she's ill now, but, yeah, she's uh, still running the store. God bless her. Yeah, I, I was talking to Tom Dreesen. Uh, I did an interview with Tom, and we were talking about her, and... She was an amazing woman. She is an amazing woman. I mean, to, to come up the way she did and uh, create that little empire on Hollywood Boulevard, you know? Well, she was just a comic's wife. It's like, you know, if you're going to the club and you know a comic and then his wife is there and then she ends up running the whole comedy industry. <laughs> who, 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 who can see that coming? <laughs> uh, she once told Jerry Seinfeld, I know she, she comes out with some, some of these things, man. She told uh, Jerry Seinfeld uh, to go back to being an accountant. And uh, after he made it big, he found out where she used to walk up and down the hill. And he bought a house up there and put about five Porsches out front. And she'd have to walk by. And he would say, uh, so I'm an accountant, huh? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, she has said some wild things to people. You know, I would just. I had forgot the wackiest thing she ever said to me, but I was just reading uh, Jimmy Walker's memoir, Dynamite, you know, and I turned the page, and there's a story about me in there, uh, which Mitzi had told me one time. You know, I was getting spots, and I quit, you know, I, I, I didn't get any spots, so I, I called her up one day and said, Mitzi, what's the deal? How come I'm not getting any spots? And so she wanted me to meet her for dinner across the street from the comedy store, so I went over there, and uh, I go, okay, well, Mitzi, what's the problem? She goes, you know, honey... The reason I can't put you on anymore is because your aura. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? <laughs> she said, yeah, your aura, it's aqua, and it needs to be a light powder blue. <laughs> I was like, you know, processing all this, and I'm, you know, and I'm literally considering 
grabbing her by the neck, <laughs> you know. And I, and, I, and I weighed the pros and cons of that. I said, let me see if I grab her by the neck right now and squeeze the life out of her. You know, I'll get spots of the improv. I'll be notorious in the comedy world. And, and you know, it was an option. Then, since I know her so well, I just knew that she likes to mess with you. You just agree with what she says, and then yeah. she's on to somebody else. Yeah, she liked me because I used to call her kiddo. I said, how are we doing tonight, kiddo? And for some reason, she liked that. She would give me spots. And, and, and then I went through that dry period, too. I went through like a month of nothing. I said, wow, what's going on? You know. And uh, Well, you know, when I asked her what I could do about my aura, she, I said, yeah, but what can I do about that? And she said, well, you know, honey, when you're on stage, I want you. And she's gesturing into the air. Like Gloria Swanson on on the Boulevard, like and Norma Desmond. Goes, uh, you know, when you're on stage, you should think of the, about the sky. Think of the sky, and then I don't know. Maybe you should wear a blue shirt and some crystals. I mean, and I said, yeah, okay. You know, I'm going to work on that, Mitzi. You know, thanks. Well, I think that long hair you kind of gave her that connotation every time she looked at you. She must have thought you were Indian instead of half Japanese. Well, she used to call me Poker. It's Poker Hines. Poker Hines. Uh, Let me tell you the favor yeah. she did for me by doing that. I went to the improv. I said, man, I can't, I can't deal with this craziness. I got to go to the improv. So I went to the improv and started getting spots there. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I was getting spots at the store still. So I was one of the few guys who were actually were getting spots at their the improv and uh, Laugh Factory at that time early on when you weren't supposed to do that. Which I think is unfair. The- totally unfair. I mean, we're, we're trying to make a living. You know, if they really if they really had the comic's best interest in art, let a guy work. Yeah, what's the big deal? I mean, it's they, well, it's all about money with them. You know, you know the, the name of the game. I mean, it's their egos with each other. You know, Bud mid their own ego war. That has nothing to do with the comics. Comics don't care. They just want to get on the stage and right. try to make a living. Right, yeah, because uh, he had brought me. He had asked me to come out because uh, I used to hang out at the Improv in New York. And when I came out there, I, I did a spot there. I did a few spots, and then I went over to Mitzi's. And after that, I couldn't get spots. I couldn't get anything. And he was always friendly to me, but I could never get anything. And you know, he he'd wear that silly monocle on his eye, you know, with the top oh, hat. Oh, uh, don't don't stand here. Hey, don't stand. That's Bud's big line. Don't stand in the hallway. Don't stand yeah. in the hallway. One time, you know, Barry Berry, right? <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, Barry Bear used to be one of the writers for Living Color. He used to work with Frank Lone and Jay. I'm talking to this. I'm telling this to the folks out there. Well, Barry and Barry and I, we used to hang out to like two, two, three o'clock in the morning, talking all the time. And one night he says, "Let's go over to the Improv." And I don't know why, but Bud had a tux on with a top hat and spats on his shoes. He has spats, and he's wearing a monocle. And Barry yells out of the car, "Hey, it's Mr. Peanut." <laughs> <laughs> I, you never saw me tear ass in that car so fast man. that's too funny well you know bud i guess it's still out there i haven't seen him in years the last time i saw him he fired me from canceled my gig at harris because he saw that i was working at the riviera yeah so you know he canceled me and i haven't got a spot from yeah. him since there's a lot of there's a lot of club owners like that too. We have some we have a little problem out on Long Island here. I don't work the clubs on the island, but I hear these poor comics bitching. You know, they uh, if they work only one place, if you're not famous. If you're famous, you could take you could take a dump on their stage if you're famous. That's right. And they'll get up there and clean it up. But if you're not famous, that's when they start wielding their little baby power. Yeah. Have, having their way with you. You know, and I, I always said if I ever came into a position where I won a ton of money or something and I could just waste it, I would build a club right across the street. And, you know, and just. I think that's every comic fantasy <laughs> about everybody who ever screwed them. Like, yeah, man, I wish I was. Uh, I'd be firing some people and hiring some people. Are you still, are you still doing the clubs in, in, the, in LA? Are you still doing a factory? And you... I, I do the Laugh Factory mostly because I've uh, been edged out. The guy who books the store now is telling me I'm too old. Yeah. He, to- he told me, uh, yeah, you got skills, but they're old skills. Yeah, you're old school. We need someone to say, you know, uh, an F word every two seconds and grab their crotch and maybe crap on a stage. You know, it's... Oh, uh, uh, you know, these guys have no clue, but what can you do, you know, so... Yeah, what's your take on the young comics coming up? Do you see any, any hopefuls or do you, are you seeing a melding? It's so funny that uh, I just had an experience with a young comic that... When he first started, I tried to help him, you know, t- 
tried to help him get in the store and this and that, and now he's been on Tonight Show and, you know, some other brick wall shows. And uh, this guy, I, I called him the other day for, you know, offering him a gig, and uh, he tells me that, uh, that I'm full of it and that I'm just trying to get him on the phone so I could, you know, pump his brain for some gigs. I'm like, <laughs> what? Are, are you serious? <laughs> you know, I always thought that the, the comedy stage at some points for some people is because they can't afford a psychiatrist, so they get on stage and, and get their, you know, get their rocks off that way because there's a lot of loons out there, man. Oh, yeah, no no doubt about it. God <laughs> bless them. I, yeah, oh, no, no doubt about that. But, you know, there's crazy people are you, are you still, everywhere. Are you still doing the road at all? Are you, uh, are you going cross-country? Just... just a little bit. I was working on the cruise ships. I was doing the cruise ships until I came off the ship one day and the drug dog smelled my <laughs> pipe in my bag. <laughs> and uh, they fired me, but now I'm trying to get back on the ship. Yeah. So what have you learned after uh, 30 years of doing this comedy? Have you learned anything at all? Well, I tell you what, I one of the things I learned is that I'm still learning how to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, after all this time, which is, you know, a, a good thing. I don't know if you know who Pablo Casal was, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, cello player. Right. But there's this great quote he has that I heard Carlin talking about. And this guy, in his 90s, after he'd been playing for 70 years, he said, I'm just now starting to see some improvement. It's so true. It really, every night is a new experience, isn't it? When you get on that stage, every, you say the same material, but every night there's a different inflection, there's a different reaction from the audience, there's a different feel from the stage or the lights or wherever, you, wherever you, you know, you're approaching the stage. It's, it's a total chemical uh, and an emotional feeling at the same time. Well, and sometimes, you know, they say that, they say that entertainers, live entertainers, are like the athletes of the heart. I like that quote because, you know, just like a real athlete, you could be a star athlete, like, but sometimes you just didn't have your A game that night. Right. You know, just like uh, this kid, uh, Verlander, who was pitching for Detroit in the World Series, and uh, that Sandoval hits three home runs off him in one game. Wow. <laughs> Look, I just didn't, have his, he just didn't have his stuff, and sometimes you can go up there, and you just don't have your good stuff. I don't know why. You know, sometimes I go up there and go, God, I feel like an open micer here. Where's my... Where's my talent you know and then other times you can't do wrong you know sometimes you go up there and it's just killing you go man i was born to do this right and then sometimes you get into a point where you're so relaxed you think you're so cool and then you do your joke that you love and it doesn't work <laughs> oh that's the thing about that's the only thing that enables us to do the same material over and over because we never know how it's going to go <laughs> you know? uh. and and everybody has their, like, barometer jokes, you know. You go, right, okay, right. you know, this joke's going to get so much, you know, and, and then it gets nothing, and you go, wow, okay. So some of, you, some of your influences were, were Pryor, uh, Colin, uh, Phil Silvers, that's unusual for you. Phil Silvers, what kind of I influence? I love Phil Silvers. Man, yeah. I cried when Phil Silvers died. I loved him on Bilko, first of all. Oh, he was great, know? yeah, yeah, that was great, Bilko. That yeah. was great. And then that was his character. He was the fast-talking, you know, hey, you know, that guy. I love Phil Silvers, you know, and uh, and then my other one, my other influence is Bugs Bunny. I love Bugs Bunny because Bugs Bunny was basically Groucho Marx, and I love Groucho Marx. Yeah, Groucho is unbelievable. Those like with Groucho, I love those old movies, and and I just always was amazed that you know that uh, I wanted to be Groucho that in that you could come up to somebody and say anything to anybody, you know. Right, That's what right. Groucho did just say that stuff, and you know be well, big wise ass and get away with it that's that's what i loved about him you see comics today now they're doing more autobiographical material i guess the political incorrect insurrection has caused that how do you feel about that you know i really can't speak on that because honestly i don't even know these young comics and what they're doing because I, I really don't watch comedy central and i don't watch young comedians mm -hmm. and i don't even know that many young comedians you know most of the people i know have been doing it at least 10 or 15 years. If you've been doing it less than 10 or 15 years, I don't know you. Really? I mean, you work the clubs. Don't you get an open micer or a... Uh, oh, uh, yeah, those, yeah, those guys. And I and I have to, I'm sorry to say, I really don't watch. I watch about, you know, five minutes just to see the tone of the room. Yeah. And I don't like to watch the guy up before me. Right, you know, right. I just like to see the energy, feel the energy, and then I like to... I'm one of those guys who likes to walk in the club and go right on. 
or stay in the back and just concentrate on yourself and and just tone down and just get prepared and ready to go. And when they say your name, you just run up there. You get that energy. The yeah, juice. that's the th- that's the thing with me. But you know, it's sure, somebody. You know, there's always funny people. There's, but I couldn't give you a name of anybody that I, a young guy that I thought, wow, that guy's mm-hmm. got it going on there. You know. Yeah, I asked this of a lot of comics. I'm just wondering, uh, do you like stand up better than acting? Because I know a lot of comics come in to become actors, and uh, you know, how do you feel about that? No, I'm just a pure stand-up, but the thing I, I love about stand-up as opposed to acting is, one, when you're a stand-up, you only get one take. Right. So you got one chance to get it right, right. that's it. <laughs> that's right. No, you flub a line, you, you screwed up the joke. Right. <laughs> it's a small word, like, and, the, though, you know, you mess that line up, it flows, you mess with the whole joke, and there's, there's only one take, so you got to be masterful. You know, to get it on one take. How many actors, even De Niro, can get their whole movie on one take? Mm, true, you know, true. And the other thing I, I that, you know, basically me about stand-up is that, that, you know, you see some of these comedy movies, and you might, even if it's a hit movie, you might laugh out loud once or twice. But with a stand-up comic who's good, he go out there, one guy can go out there by himself and do an hour, make people laugh every 15 seconds for an hour, and this one guy can generate more laughter than a whole cast and crew, production company, director, you know, thou- uh, literally a thousand people who are going to making a movie. This one guy can go up there and get more laughs than all those people combined. That yeah. amazes me. Right. You're, you're, you're your own director, producer, uh, actor, the whole, the whole bang. The whole deal. You're the yeah. whole, you're the whole shebang. And, and that's, that's amazing that one guy can do that. Yeah. Do you find do you find yourself getting kind of harsh and you know being a self critic you know really hard on yourself every once in a while when you yeah, do? Yeah, I, I and that's one of the spiritual things I've learned about, and you know, and that's maybe one of the reasons I got into work <clears throat> on my own personal karma out. But uh, yeah, because I'm such a harsh self critic, and my thing is I could have a a, a set and, I, and I'll I'll come off stage going, oh man, that sucked, and then my friends. We'll go, man, that was great. What are you talking about? Right, right. What got you know what got me past that is reading this book called The Four Agreements. And the I don't know if you know that book, but the fourth agreement is always do your best with the proviso that your best is going to be different from circumstance to circumstance. And you know, like you're not going to kill <laughs> Tuesday night at midnight when there's 15 people in the crowd. Like you're going to kill on Saturday at eight o'clock when it's packed. You know, if you're looking for that Saturday big response on a Tuesday night, you're going to be disappointed. You know, so now I just tell my, I just ask myself, did you do your best under the circumstance? If I could say yes to that, I just let it go. Whereas before, I'd go back to the hotel and I'd beat myself up for an hour or two at least. So, uh, so what do you do when you when you're on stage? What do you use uh, some kind of Zen approach, or uh, what do you? Yeah, that is my approach. Now, I always thought if I taught a comedy class, I'd teach it from a Zen philosophy, and that is one of the things about Zen is that they have this thing called non-attachment. Uh-huh. And that's when you're just not attached to the results. You know, you just throw it out there and see what comes back. Right. So, and because uh, when you, you know, when you're uh, too attached to the result, you know, you think, oh man, this joke's going to kill, and then it just lays there. You know, then you've got egg on your face. Oh, damn. You know, then you've got all this internal dialogue. Oh, man, Jesus, I'm kind of, they're not liking me. And, you know, I'm kind of eating it here. But, <clears> but, <throat> but when you just throw it out there, you're, it frees you up. It's like the uh, it's like not listening to the laughs actually, right? Or the or the uh, the return from the audience. If you are out there and you wait for a reaction, that throws you off. If you just concentrate on what you're doing and just relax with what you're doing, it's exactly what you're saying. Well, you know, I love this line that I heard Shirley MacLaine say, and she was saying, uh, "When I believe what I'm saying, it works. Right. When I watch myself saying it; it doesn't work." <clears throat> And so that's the thing. And also, you know, also I, I play basketball. That's my thing. I'm still a gym rat. <laughs> you know, doing a joke is like shooting a basketball. You know, you can't think too much. You can't aim. It's a feel thing. You just got to let it go. And it, it, either it's going in or it's not going in. Right. You know, and you got to be okay with either one. You just got to keep shooting. It's going to hit or it's not going to hit, but you can't let that bother you. And you just got to keep shooting. And the other trick I, I learned, too, when I get on stage is I make my surroundings my own. 
<clears throat> in other words, it's my living room and you're the audience and welcome to my home. Oh, yeah. When you go on stage that you own the room, you've got to you got to have that kind of arrogant attitude or whatever you want to call it to, to feel, OK, you know, this is my room now. When I got the mic and the lights on me, I, I'm I'm the goth of this room. I own this room. And, <laughs> and, you know, you're running the show. And, you know, after it's over, you're, you're not running the room. But, you know. Even if you're an open micer, that's yeah. got to be your attitude. Hey, this is my room. I own this room. Yeah, I always tell the young comics, I said, listen, they, they would come and go, oh, this guy's killing up there, man. I said, listen, you know who taught me something was Freddie Soto. Remember Freddie Soto? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> He'd go on after like, uh, oh, God, say like Dice Clay was on there for an hour, you know, and oh, kill, yeah. and killing the room. And Freddie would come up <clears throat> and he would applaud Dice and, be totally, you know, not gratuitous, but, you know, warm and friendly. He said, that was Dice Clay. Give him a hand. He'd be smiling and everything. And he'd say, boy, wasn't he great? And he'd have the audience going, yeah, he was great. And, and the audience in their mind would be thinking, you're a great guy, too, because you're not taking it personal and you're so relaxed. And then he would own the stage, like we were talking about before, and, and just take over and slowly build that whole room up to his own persona. Yeah, and that's when, you know, that takes some experience and that takes, you know, some chops and going on late night. And, uh, you know, a lot of these new kids, that's what, you know, I have no patience when I hear some new guy complaining about how late he has to go on or, you know, this or that. Because we all did that. I mean, that's part of the game. You got to go on last and, you know, the five drunk people and right. figure it out. Paul Mooney used to come in after doing shows. He'd come in, there'd be maybe four people in the audience, and he would do half an hour to 40 minutes. Oh, Moody was great. Moody was the best at going on late uh, and, and making something out of it. Because, I mean, you know, I love Paul. I always say Paul's my favorite nut in the asylum. <laughs> now, he's so full so of true. himself that he doesn't, yeah. need, he doesn't even need four people, okay? Right. He just, he just needs the, the mic and even nobody in there <laughs> going to gonna go on for an hour so true so true. have a good set even <laughs> in his mind oh god so uh so what would you say to a young comic today if if, if i come up and i say M mr Purdue, i want to do comedy what it, w w how should i go about it i'd say you know like you know you know you have to get on everywhere you possibly can whenever <laughs> you can get on you got to get on right and you've got to be a student of comedy you got to watch everybody like like, when I first came to L.A., I went to the comedy store every single night, you know, because, one, I had nothing else to do, and I was in L.A. to do comedy, but I had no money to go anywhere else, and <laughs> I was fascinated, and I would watch everybody. Right. right. So you got to watch everybody, not to just, not only to see what works, but to see what doesn't work, you know? Go, oh, yeah, this guy's screwing up, and this guy made this mistake, and, you know, to watch all this stuff, like... Like, I know when I started, one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen was uh, Tony Clifton. Right. You know, to see Tony Clifton, Andy Kaufman, you know, push the room that far where people wanted to kill him when he would throw a drink in, you know, somebody's face that was, a, you know, which is staged, or he'd slap somebody who was a chill in the audience, but the audience didn't know that. But just to see him get this crowd like a hornet's nest and you just go wow okay you know i i maybe i could take a crowd out there not this far but you know you you see what all the parameters are then i remember as a young comic scene david fry i don't know if you remember david oh fry david yeah david's an old friend sure he was yeah, an old he, uh, he passed away right oh yeah he was great man a little crazy a little crazy in the head oh, he was out of his mind oh, yeah. you know especially he was a bitter guy he drank yeah. too much and yeah you know, I, when I first started, I uh, saw him at the comedy store just have a meltdown on stage. Mm. You know, so it's stuff like that. You see guys that, you know, make it work. See guys who don't, don't make it work. But again, back to advice in the young comic, I'd say take it all in. you got to be a sponge. Also, the other, other advice I would say today, the way things are with the industry and television, I would say you've got to be a good marketeer. You have to know how to get your fan base going. Dane Cook is proof of that. I mean, he knew. Yeah, which I know. don't know how to do. I, I'm really terrible well, at you, that. Young comics today, you better start doing that. you got to get your fan base down. Start The minute you start in the business, start getting those emails. Start going out and getting yeah, those yeah, websites. Yeah, and, I know. You know, and uh, Twitter and all this other crap. And See, just, those guys know how to do that. These young kids, you know, who grew up with that know how to do that. You know, you got to yeah. Dinosaur like me, 
Well, in our day, in our day, people came to see us. You know, and today it's yeah. today there's so much out there. You know, you got to bring you got to bring asses in and fill those seats. It's not like the old days where the clubs used to spend money to get you to get you an audience. Now you got to bring your own audience, and that's what these kids are going through today. And uh, it's uh, pretty painful for some of them. I could imagine. I I could imagine, but you know, it's always something. You know, like even before we started, there's always been sort of a, a war between the talent and the and the club owner or the booker. And I find that's the hardest thing about doing stand-up comedy is not the performing. That's the easy part. The hard part is dealing with these people who own the clubs, the book the clubs. These, you well, know, you got to understand. Go through and yeah, you got to understand one thing about club owners. <clears throat> if they could put a mic stand on a stage and people would pay to see the mic stand, they wouldn't have you there, right? So basically, it's just and, business. And a lot of these club owners, like in the Midwest, this is why I have respect for Mitzi Short, the comedy story. Yeah, Mitzi was crazy, and she, you know, she wielded a lot of power. And she did what she did. But at least she had the number one club in the country. You go out to the Midwest somewhere. Some guy just opened the Chuckle Hut somewhere. And that guy's got an attitude like he's Cecil B. the Miller, you know. Yeah, I know, I know. He was selling, six, he was selling carpet six months earlier, <laughs> but all of a sudden, now that he bought a club, right? He's, a, he's an expert. <clears throat> yeah. And then he's willing all this power with the local comics. Yeah. You know, telling this guy, yeah, you can MC for me if you go to this other club. Well, that's that, that. That's where the power comes from. That's why you have to get your own fan base. Because if your fan base follows you around, you tell the club owner, hey, I'll go across the street to that pizza parlor, put my name up on the wall, and, and I'll fill the room. I don't need you. See, that's that's what these kids have to do today. Because it's, they, everybody thinks they're a comic. There's, what, 85? When we started, there was, what, 30, 40 guys? Now there's, what, 85,000 guys? I got 40 guys in Port Jefferson where I live alone. You know, it's 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 become uh, the norm. Everybody can. Everybody's a comic, like everybody's an actor. There must be a million actors out there, but the same five hundred keep working. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's that's the deal. I mean, everybody wants to be a comic, and then it kills me when everybody says, "I'm a headliner." You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a headliner. Yeah, everybody's a headliner. I have never seen an, uh, too many open micers or middle acts. Everybody's a headliner. It's amazing, just amazing. It's amazing. You know, there's that old joke about. Uh, all the comics are sitting in the bar after the gig and the headliner sitting there and uh, somebody comes up to the headliner and says, oh man, you are really great. You are really funny, man. That was great. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Then he says to the guy, says to the middle act, hey, you were good too. And then he turns to the opening act and says, hey, you got a light? <laughs> and, and, and that's how it is with some of these people out there who are just in the beginning stage yeah. want to be the headliner. And, and whenever you work with a guy who's middling for you, the first thing out of his mouth is, you know, I usually headline. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever, man. I always hear the audience going, oh, oh, this guy's just the opener, and the middle guy's, okay, it's it's the last guy you want to see. It's really the last guy you want to see. And I'm predicting this now, with all this talent running around out there and all this bad talent that's out there, it, there's, there's a change coming, and I see... Uh, there's going to be an excess of really good, talented people, and I think they're going to go into one of these uh, one-man show markets, and that's going to be the next rule because the one-man show is what the people really want to see in the first place. You know, they really want to see the one guy, and the, the one guy is going to develop his own one-man show, and, and uh, he'll go around with his fan base and uh, start taking the rooms over that way. I, I, I see this maybe in another five years. Well, you know, generally in the club, what you said is true. You know, I find a lot of times when you go in these clubs with a three-man show, like a lot of times, I'd say 90% of the time, the MC opening act has no business on stage. Yeah. So they just got that guy because he picked you up at the airport, you know. The right. middle act sucks 50% of the time. Right. And the headliner is the show, <clears throat> and that guy has to be good, you know, all the time. Right. Think right. about our business. You're the headliner. You know, if you're in baseball, if you're batting 300, you're a Hall of Famer. If you're a comic batting 300, you know, you're homeless. <laughs> you know, you got as a headliner, you got to be batting 950 at That's least. That's right. That's right, man. And, and, and in any situation, man, because there's so many different situations. I've seen comics, you know, they, they work in, in New York City, and then they would work with me out in the suburbs, you know, and... and They'd be talking about trains and stuff, and people just staring at them like, you know, what are you talking about, you know? And they they turn around and get mad and say, ah, this, this audience sucks. No, you got to learn how to adapt. You know, that's well, another thing. a lot thing. of these guys who get 
a lot of spots in town, you know, like the comedy <clears> store <throat> or whatever, the comic strip in New York, whatever. And, and, you know, they get a lot of spots. And so they got, a lot of times, they got a really good tight 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. And then they get out there on the road and, you know, it's not flying. Right. You know, because they just don't have the chops for that. That's why, uh, you know, a road comic, uh, I think a road comic has the most chops out there of anybody. Yeah, well, 60% of the people in the in the, in the inner cities are basically looking for that uh, that actor job, you know, or that writer job, maybe, or... Yeah, like, see, that's not... never me. I've always just been a stand-up, and I never really wanted to be an actor, or I just wanted to be a comic. I just wanted to, you know... Yeah make a living as a stand-up comic which gets harder and harder each year but somehow by the grace of god i managed to you know pull it out of my ass every year somehow well i see you know i hate to bash comedy central but you know they, it's i don't think it's their fault but they just they're such an eating machine that they just chew up so much material and time and and I think they I think they really you know soup up their their uh, shows because I'm watching these shows with these comics, and you know like I hear laughs where they shouldn't be, and I see you know I hear applauds where they shouldn't be, and, I, and I'm thinking this stuff is canned, you know. Now I'm finding out from some friends of mine that you know that they do dope some of these shows up, and uh, but it it gives the wrong impression to the to these kids out there that they all think they can do this. It's so simple. It's it's not that simple. It takes years. You know, it's it's like going to a gym and developing muscles. It don't, you don't do it overnight. It takes time. You know, these guys with five years, five years is nothing in this business. You got to have ten, nothing. fifteen, twenty years in here to know what the hell you're doing. Well, I always I always <clears> say if some guy makes it look easy, it's not because it is easy. It's because that guy's just really good at it. Right. Right. You know, most people could not get up there and say their name and address off their driver's license. I'm <laughs> freaking out. That's true. <laughs> you know, much less go up there and do an hour. You know, that takes a whole lot of chops. And, you know, that's my thing about working the cruise ships is I didn't have to compete with these young guys because they don't have the time. Right. To, to do the cruise gig, you need an hour and a half of material. You need a, a clean half hour family show. Then you need another hour of uh, adult stuff. Right, and these guys who are just coming out now that they're doing it less than ten years, they don't even have a half an hour. Right, right, right. You know, and that's and then not only have the time, but stuff that's tight, stuff that works, not just hey, where you're from and all that filler they got going on. Yeah. So you had a good time tonight. Yeah, man. You know, it's good to, good to touch base with you again, and uh, you know, I'm always uh, you know looking to help somebody out. You know, right, man. If I could add my two cents, and you know. Well, you did a good job tonight. Uh, We're all in the same community. We're all brothers. Jackson, what's your what? You got a website at all? Like I said, I'm. You know, I don't. I'm. I'm like so old school. <laughs> I don't have a As a matter of fact, I lost a gig <laughs> in Hong Kong versus gig in Hong Kong. And yeah. I had, I had all this guy's favorite guys tell him that I was great. Yeah. And then, and then this is the first. The guy sends me an email. He says, "Yeah, I heard you're good, but uh, being funny isn't." the criteria we're going by you need to have a website so these people can tune in and see you know what you did blah 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 i go oh, really okay well funny's no longer the criteria well, you like, get somebody and get a website built will you please because you're too funny yeah, i know I I, I, <clears throat> I, I I i need to do that you're too funny man you should get out there and do your thing you know come on be a marketeer do it do what i was telling you yeah, well, actually, I just got a new girlfriend who's good at that, so she says, "Yeah, I'm going to do that for you." Well, give her, yeah, you know, right. give her a little extra at night, and you know, she'll put some <laughs> put some good stuff in. Listen, Jackson, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you okay, bro, giving up this it. time, man. Help. You're a great guy, and uh, I wish you all the best, man. Okay, Frank. All right, good, take man. care, Talk to you. Jackson Purdue, comedian over 25 years, very talented guy. You got to catch him on YouTube. He doesn't have a website right now. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, some guys, you know, I know guys that still have old typewriters.